Hi, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. Democracy, elections, 2024, threats of totalitarianism. It is enough to give you heartburn and to make you want to hide under your bed. But of course, you can't. If you cede the field to the people who want to destroy our democracy, they win. And I fear that um, with so much at stake and with people obsessing over polls a year out, that there gets to be a sense of fatalism, a sense of um, inevitability. And of course, the election really hasn't even begun. We're just under a year away, and the campaigns uh, have not really begun in earnest, although many of you who watch the news, listen to the news, read the news incessantly, feel like it's been going on for forever. The average person doesn't tune in until about... Uh, September of 2024, believe it or not. So we got a long ways to go. You got to pace yourself. You got to keep up. And I think it's also important to understand that there are people out there who are working on behalf of democracy, not a particular candidate, not a particular political party. We've tried to feature some of these on this program. And we have another guest uh, this week um, who's going to talk about it. And she is Joanna Lidgate. She is the uh, head of an organization called States United. They work in the democracy space to help uh, voters, to help election officials to make sure our elections run smoothly, fairly, and that every vote gets counted. And that's really the very definition of democracy, um, getting the votes counted, getting them recorded accurately, and then agreeing to abide by them. What a concept, right? Well, uh, Joanna is going to tell us all about the work that she does. Um, so without further ado, Joanna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I constantly tell my listeners that there are organizations out there doing great work in defense of democracy. So you are the executive director of States United. Tell us what the organization is and how it came to be. So we started in the summer of 2020 and really started from the principle that the people who run our elections in this country, the statewide officials, governors, state attorneys general, secretaries of state, but also the county and local officials uh, are the guardians of our democracy. They're the people who really are carrying uh, this system of government on their backs. And they were, of course, uh, that, that summer, that, that year up against a really unprecedented threat dealing with uh, election-related lies and conspiracy theories and litigation and violence and threats of violence in a way that they never had before. And uh, my co-founders and I, you know, sort of looked at what was happening in, in this moment in the country. We were all doing various other things and, and enjoying our jobs and um, decided that this was really the fight uh, of our time. And we needed to start an organization that was focused on supporting um, those, those frontline workers in our democracy, really giving them wraparound support in this time to help them do their work of running and protecting and defending elections. And of course, the fight has really uh, only grown and, and continued and, and sort of shape-shifted since then. Um, we've made it through the 2022 midterms and now looking ahead to 2024, but really continuing that same work of supporting the people who make who make our democracy go and thus really every other issue that we care about as Americans, because um, everything uh, that matters in this country comes down to free and fair elections. In 2022, we had a near-death experience, mm -hmm. um, I would call it, when we had a huge number of election deniers, not only running for Congress, but running for secretaries of state, for attorneys general, for governors. All of these people, as we learned during the 2020 election, are critical to making sure elections run fairly, mm -hmm. run smoothly, and that the votes get counted and certified. The American people 
overwhelmingly rejected these people. Yes, some of them won in red, deep red states, but frankly, in all of the swing states, these secretary of state candidates, the attorneys general, the governors lost. What did you gain from that experience? Why do you think the American people did that? And what does that tell you in the, about the future and about future elections? So the thing that literally gets me out of bed every day, Jen, is that 75% of Americans say that they want every vote counted more than they want their preferred candidate to win. So we know that fundamentally people believe in a system where, you know, the majority gets to choose (laughs) who, who runs our country, who runs our government. Um, They believe in a system that's free and fair where every vote is counted. And I think we really saw that play out in the midterms. You know, a lot of these races that matter so much for our democracy and so much for, as I said, the issues that we care about really have not been uh, enough, you know, front of people's minds in the past. A lot of folks didn't know what their secretary of state did or who that person was or, you know, why it matters that you elect an attorney general who's going to defend your votes in court or a governor who's going to set strong voting policy and and make sure that elections get certified. And in 2020, we went through an experience where people, Americans really got to see these officials in action. And, And let me be really clear, we're a bipartisan organization and we watched Republicans and Democrats stand up all across the country and speak truth about our elections and and defend our votes. And and I think people came to understand a little bit better what was at stake. In the midterms, as you said, election deniers ran all across the country and they lost 90% of their races in the statewide races. So for governor, state AG, secretary of state in the battleground states, it was a clean sweep. Uh, So we watched American voters, you know, reject these candidates. And I think what it really came down to was a lot of work that happened by so many different organizations and and a lot of work by candidates and, and frankly, by the media to explain to voters what was at stake, why it mattered, how the system works. And, And I think, you know, if we can do that again in 2024, we will watch people once again Uh, turn out for democracy and turn out for a system that's free and fair and secure. I think people really fundamentally want that and and believe in it. In some respects, we may face an even worse environment in 2024 than we did in 2022 or 2020. Twitter, now X, has become a toxic waste dump of disinformation, uh, lies, conspiracy theories, and the rest. We have a Supreme Court that has shown it is relatively hostile to voting rights, although it did send back to several states um, a redo order on maps that were frankly, illegal, should never have been used in 2022. But we also have um, the phenomenon of Donald Trump and uh, MAGA people who say, no, we're the truth. We're acting in good faith. Believe us. And have really, in essence, trained a certain segment of the American people to disbelieve reality, Mm -hmm. to believe that they are under siege Mm -hmm. What keeps you up at night? What is what are the weak points in our system that you're looking to bolster before we get to 2024? Yeah, well, you know, you're absolutely right, Jen. I think this fight is going to be uh, even more challenging than the one we saw in 2020. It's going to require um, every voter in this country to to tune in and to really do the work to understand what's at stake in, in the races in their own locality and, and state and, and nationally. Um, you know, I, I talked about how election deniers lost so many of their races in the midterms in those statewide races, but they actually gained ground in in other places. You know, they won 64 percent of the races for Congress. They, they won in state legislatures. They won in county and local positions, which are so critical to running and overseeing elections. And so 
I really think about the threat kind of at three different levels. The, the first is the, the federal level. We, of course, have, you know, two candidates right now in, in the race who are very prominent election deniers, one of whom is likely to be the nominee. We, we have, as I said, a Congress where uh, we have a lot of members who you know voted not to certify in 2020 who are still in office. Um, we thankfully have the ECRA, which will do some work to mitigate the threat in Congress. Um, but, you know, that, that, that is very real. And, and a lot of people with very strong, very big bully pulpits who are, you know, spreading lies and conspiracy theories every day about our elections, and that works to undermine trust. So that's kind of the first layer. And just to Clarify for our listeners, the ECRA is the Electoral Count Reform Act, which tried to plug some holes that Trump and his lawyers um, tried to exploit um, in the certification, in the opening of the electoral votes, in seeking uh, redress in the courts. And I think those were very important. But I think we also learned in 2020 is the best laws, Mm -hmm. the most clearly written laws do not save us if people are going to act in bad faith. If judges aren't going to follow the law, if lawmakers are going to behave in ways that are disregarding the written rules. So it's a help, but it's not a foolproof uh, formula for avoiding difficulties. So yeah, that's absolutely right. And, 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 you know, not only can we, you know, not account even with the best laws for people who choose to disregard them and certainly for, for uh, you know, courts that uh, may take action that, you know, we so far haven't haven't seen, but but we could certainly see in the future. But but that's just the first layer. That national federal layer is just the first layer, and then we have you know the state landscape. And as I said at the outset, states are absolutely critical in this fight. States run elections. Um, they're national events, but they're run by the states. So what's happening at the state level is really important. And while we did have uh, a lot of election deniers lose in those statewide positions, um, we still have a number of them who are going to be in charge of elections across the country. And we still, of course, have the landscape of state legislatures who, who play a role um, in, in the certification process. And as you said, courts, um, some of which have changed over the last four years. And then you take it down to the final layer, which is the local layer. And elections, as we all know, because we go to our polling place, you know, we all have local election officials, election judges and the like who are overseeing the process uh, where we live. And unfortunately, we do have election deniers who've taken over a number of those positions um, over the last few years, it's been an incredibly difficult climate for our local election officials. Not only have they had to deal with this constant onslaught of, you know, disinformation and and litigation, but they've dealt with threats like never before, had to worry about their own safety, the safety of their children. Um, We've had attrition in those positions. And so there's going to be room for mischief by election deniers at all three of those levels, national, state, and local, and we are going to all need to stay uh, vigilant. And uh, as I said, it's going to be a big, big fight, which is why I'm so glad for people like you, Jen, who are helping to, you know, really sound the alarm and, and help people understand what's at stake in this moment. Thank you. I am here to tell you about a great product. Actually, I don't know whether it's a product or it's a service because it's like having a chef come to your door. HelloFresh, they are the people who send to your doorstep at your request, at your specific time, a delicious, wonderful meal. All you have to do is put it together. It comes pre-measured with all the ingredients, instructions that are idiot-proof, which is very good for me. You don't need to go to the grocery store. You don't need to worry about leftovers. It makes cooking easy and fun during the holiday season. 
it's going to save you hours and hours. You're going to get to impress all those guests who will think you are a magical chef. But the best thing about it is you can specify exactly what you want. If you only eat fish, you can put that in. If you only eat vegan, you can put that in. You can have what you want when you want and what could be better than that. It is a wonderful product. It is something that will make your life easy. And how many things can you say about that? Uh, so how do you get this? How do you get this wonderful product? You go to hellofresh.com slash greenroomfree and you use the code greenroomfree. And what do you get? You get a free breakfast for life. I am serious, for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. That's a free breakfast. When can you ever get something free for life? My goodness. Everyone can also look for the link uh, in the show notes. But remember, HelloFresh, it is the number one meal kit in America, and you will love it. Bon appetit. You know, the polls show overwhelmingly that people believe democracy is at issue mm -hmm. and people say democracy is on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But I wonder and I worry that people have very different definitions or understanding of what democracy means. To Donald Trump, democracy means I win. And if I don't, the deck is stacked. Mm -hmm. So when voters are interacting with candidates, when they're watching debates, when they're listening to ads, what is it that they should be listening for? What is the tell, if you will, when they want to figure out whether this person is going to defend democracy in the traditional sense, following the mm -hmm. rules, the rule of law, counting all the votes, or be a election denier and a sycophant for a party that doesn't believe in democracy? How do they tell? What's, what are some clues? It's such a great question. And it, it's such an important point because, you know, democracy does mean different things to different people. We hear Donald Trump used that word a lot. He certainly uses it very differently than you or I might <laughs> understand it or use it. The good news is at States United, we've actually just released a really helpful resource. It's uh, electiondeniers.org, and it's a comprehensive website that tracks this movement as a whole, you know, how it has developed and grown over the last few years, who's running in these key races all across the country, um, not just the statewide and the president, the presidential races, but also importantly, the races for Congress, because as we discussed, Congress plays an important role here too, um, and gives people information specifically about what different candidates and different elected officials have said and done when it comes to our elections. I'll go back to that number I referenced of the percentage, the incredibly high percentage of Americans who say that they want every vote counted more than they want their candidate to win. And so I think what's really useful about this website is it allows people to see, okay, what specifically has this person said? You know, what actions have they taken? Do they, you know, did they, did they try to overturn the 2020 results? Um, have they claimed that, you know, Joe Biden isn't the, isn't the rightful president? Do they belong to a, a militia group or another anti-democracy group, you know, that, that has promoted violence in this country? And, and we find, you know, over time and as we talk with voters that the more people come to understand about what a particular leader or, you know, candidate has said and done, um, the more, as I, as I said earlier, they'll turn out for democracy. They'll turn out for this idea that they want the system to be free and fair. And, and look, Donald Trump has told us who he is. We need to believe him. Um, when he comes out on stage and says he's proud to be an election denier, you know, that, that, <laughs> that, that's very clear. Um, his positions are very clear. The, the, the threats he's made, that the plans that he's laid out, the vision he has for this country um, is not something that, that he, um, you know, 
equivocates about it all. So I think it's really important for, for across the board for Americans to look at all of these different races and, and just as we do with Trump to really understand what people have said and done and, and where they stand specifically on the issue of our elections because um, they're, they're everything. They're everything in this country for, for everything else that matters. We will put that link in our show notes so people can go to it and keep track of these races as time goes on. But you said something, Joanna, that I think is really important. Donald Trump isn't hiding Mm. what he is about. Although his supporters get nervous when he candidly says what his plans are, um, it's important to take him seriously and literally. Mm -hmm. And when he says things like, I'm going to use the military to clamp down on demonstrations, Mm -hmm. meaning peaceful demonstrations, when he says he's going to use the Justice Department to get retribution against his enemies, when he says he's out to destroy the civil service, these are the things that authoritarians say and that are really inimical to our democratic institutions and values. When you talk to reporters, when you talk to ordinary voters, what do you try to communicate about his plans, about how out of touch this is with our American traditions of democracy, fair play, civilian control over the military Mm -hmm. and the rest? Well, you know, I think the, the first thing is that people need to understand the impact that he's having on this country. Um, you know, inciting a violent attack on the Capitol, years of lies about elections and, and, and results, um, a constant stream of conspiracy theories. This stuff has real consequences. Um, I, I talked earlier about the election officials who um, have had their safety and in some cases their lives put at risk because of the things that Trump and his allies have said. The movement is absolutely bigger than Trump now. This election denial movement, it may have started with him. He may have kind of created the spark. It is much bigger than him. So I want to be clear about that. But, you know, you can see the way that he's damaged Uh, trust in our elections and and the fabric of this country. And that's going to take time to get back. Um, It's interesting because when you, uh, you know, talk with Americans about the system, another thing that, that, that you find is that people have a lot of faith in um, their, their local election officials. These are in many cases, our friends and neighbors. They're, they're people that we see around town. We go to a polling place. We're grateful for their service. Um, And these are jobs that have for so, so long um, been really important to the functioning of our country, but maybe have gone um, under, under recognized. And, And so I think when we, again, really help people understand you know, what's happening in this system, um, what this is really about, what motives Trump has to lie about the system. You know, why is he doing this? Why is he saying this? And and, and, and where the truth actually lies, um, it, it, that's really going to be the, the, the critical fight here. Um, you know, in my, in my prior job, I served as the deputy attorney general for the state of Massachusetts, and I served during the time when Trump took office. Um, we watched, you know, in, in the buildup to that, that he made a bunch of different campaign promises. And, and sure enough, when he took office, he made good on those campaign promises. Everything from the, you know, travel ban to the, the birth control mandate to the climate rollbacks and and, you know, as a coalition of states, um, there were a number of us who, who took him to court and we won 80 percent of those cases and we were able to hold the line on democracy and the rule of law. But, but we've seen <laughs> Trump's track record. So whether it's, you know, um, threats to dismantle government or enact retribution against uh, those who've been his political opponents, um, you know, uh, we have to take him at his word. He thinks he should decide elections. Um, he thinks he should be the law. And, you know, these are these are absolutely, as you say, um, values that are that are at, at odds with who we are as a country. And and I think the good news is if we can do this work of um, educating voters and, and making sure people really turn out, um, I think people will once again vote for for democracy in 2024. A 
I'm glad you mentioned the work that you did during the Trump years. I think that's how I got to know uh, the governor, your partner, um, Maura Healy, uh, Norm Eisen, who's been critical in the States United movement. And I think people need to recall that when you get someone like this, any issue you care about that has popular support is going to be blocked because once democracy collapses, once people are not accountable and decide they don't have to listen to the voters, then if your issue is climate change Mm -hmm. or abortion rights or guns or foreign policy or education, all of that is impeded if democracy fails, that you don't get to those issues until you solve and you protect the democratic process. And there is, uh, I think there was a a good civics lesson during the Trump years Mm -hmm. that one of the uh, bulwarks against uh, totalitarianism is our federal system, that the states did remarkable work in trying to defend, you know, basic statutes that have operated for decades under Republicans, under Democrats, clean air laws, um, our immigration laws, and the rest. So I think this is um, really vital stuff. And although people kind of roll their eyes because they think, oh, catastrophizing, we've seen this movie before. We know how this comes out. Um, Readers and listeners always ask, well, what can I do? Mm. Um, and they spend, I think, too much time on social media getting scared <laughs> and they get a sense of fatalism and paralysis. So talk to us about some of the things ordinary Americans can do if they're concerned about this. Well, I think, you know, the first is um, being online isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially if you're online researching all, all as I said, all of these races and, and all of these candidates. So uh, go to electiondeniers.org. Our website, statesunitedemocracy.org, also has a lot of information, um, everything from, you know, what's happening with the, the cases against Trump to, you know, um, uh, what's happening in the courts and, and et cetera. So, um, I, I recommend that as well. I, I think that, um, educating oneself and, and educating one's friends, neighbors, community is probably the, the, the first and highest order, uh, for all of us, because we are living in this moment of unprecedented, uh, disinformation, you know, lies, conspiracies, and, 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 and really siloing of information. And so, um, the more that we can each do just as citizens and everyday people to uh, to fight that, to promote truth and facts, um, to push back on conspiracies where we see them, um, that that's going to be really critical, especially with the rise of AI in this moment um, and the ways in which I think that's going to make it or could make it even harder for people to to access the truth. Um, another thing that 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 folks can do is, uh, you know, make sure to uh, find opportunities to get involved, whether that's volunteering as a poll worker, whether that's uh, working on behalf of a pro-democracy candidate, whether Republican or Democrat. There are so many of them out there. Um, we absolutely need good people in government in this moment more than ever. Um, and and participating in, in this process, participating in democracy, of course course, getting out and voting uh, next year. We were happy to see that this year in 2023, in the races that there were, um, voters continued this trend of rejecting election denier candidates. Um, and, you know, we, we need to see that happen again. So, um, you know, spreading spreading the word, um, fighting for the truth and, and, and jumping in and getting involved. Those are, those are three things that I think everyone can do right now. And I want to go back to 2018 when um, a large group of individuals, many of them women, mm. looked around and they said, there's no secret sauce to being in public office. You don't need some inside information. And in fact, some of the people in office don't have a lot of information. And they ran themselves. Uh, We had people, it's interesting now, they're moving up to higher office, but people like Abigail Spanberger, uh, Lisa Slotkin in Michigan, um, all around the country who many of them, frankly, had a national security background. They had a sense of public service. And they said, you know, I can run for office. Now, 
it's not everyone's cup of tea and it's no um, really uh, easy matter these days. But ordinary people can run for office. They can run for city council, for school board, for all of these offices and for state legislatures as well. Um, if people are interested in learning more about how to be a candidate, how to run, wh- what would you suggest they do? Um, I think the average person says, oh, I could never do it, or I don't know how to do it. Um, when you're talking to your friends and colleagues and so on, trying to encourage them, what do you tell them? Well, I love that. Um, it is, and you're absolutely right. I think especially for women too often, you know, we feel like we have to have all of the perfect qualifications and experience and um, I, I think the first thing is to to get out and, and, and get a sense of democracy at the local level. As I said, you know, volunteering, um, engaging in a campaign, um, participating in, you know, whether it's school committee or, or um, your local uh, select board or, or whatever the local body is and, and just really kind of being part of that. I think that's a, that's a great place to start. Um, there's also great organizations out there that help people who are considering running for office, groups like Run for Something. You know, we need especially people in these uh, election administration jobs who are committed to being uh, professional, nonpartisan, and that is always how our system has been. Um, so we need to preserve that and we need to make sure that we don't allow election deniers and conspiracy theorists to take over the system. Um, and and so um, that's, a, that's another great option. You know, the reason we exist as an organization is that it's not enough just to get really good pro-democracy leaders elected. We also need to support them when they're in office. So another piece of this, Jen, is making sure that, you know, once we get good people into those positions, these jobs are hard um, and that we have, uh, we, we have, you know, the, the support to allow them to, you know, really achieve, to make sure that they're safe. We divide our work into a few categories at States United. Um, protecting elections is our bread and butter, but we also have a project that's focused on public safety in elections because we want to make sure that, you know, people who are in these jobs um, are able to do these jobs, that they're not, you know, um, driven out of them by by threats or harassment or, or threats of violence. Um, we have an accountability project, which is focused on making sure that when uh, people step outside the bounds in our democracy, um, that there are consequences for that. So, you know, really, really trying to make sure that the system as a whole um, functions well, that the people in these jobs um, have the support they need. And as you say, that uh, good people are stepping up and, and running for office. Um, as somebody who's, you know, worked in, in public service for many years, it's uh, probably the most rewarding thing I've done. And and we need good people now more than ever. So as we wrap up our time together, what makes you optimistic? Um, why do you get up every day and do the things that you do? Um, I talk to readers, listeners all the time, and people could get so despondent and so fearful. What what should they look at? What do you look at that gives you hope for American democracy? Well, I'll tell you, I get to work every day with the most incredible uh, heroes of our democracy, the people who are running elections at the local level, at, at the state level. Um, these are people who have an incredible sense of dedication and patriotism and incredible commitment to this free, fair, nonpartisan system that we've always had in this country. People who have, um, you know, put up with really unimaginable things in order to be able to keep doing their jobs and, and done them with such bravery and commitment. Um, we, we watched many of them in action in 2020. I will promise you we will see them in action again in 2024. And I think it's really um, those election officials who, who motivate me every day, um, their stories, you know, from the, the person who founded the Young Republicans Club in high school and was one of the most, you know, vocal uh, um, critics uh, of of Trump's uh, disinformation campaign in in 2020, um, to you know secretaries of state who who have stepped up and and just done their jobs in, in ways that we you know we we truly couldn't ask for more. 
as a country. So um, I I think we have a, a really um, a really wonderful system in this country, and I think we have to do absolutely everything in our power to protect it. And you know, we talked earlier, Jen, about about how much people really do. Uh, value democracy when you when you talk with them about it and and we have those conversations with voters every day all across the country and and so I think it's really just going to be about this work of public education um, and uh, making sure that you know we're all doing everything we can leaving it all on the field <laughs> for for this fight this year um, I think the future of our democracy is at stake the future of our country is at stake and as you say, the future of every issue that we care about is at stake, um, whether it's education, uh, the economy, climate, abortion, you name it. Um, it. It's all on the table right now. Well, thank you for being here, Johanna. Um, we wish you all the luck and all of the uh, support you need um, in fighting this good fight. And uh, we'll check back with you next year and see how the fight is going. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Jen. Great to see you. And that was Joanna Lidgate. Uh, Important words of advice. First of all, she reminds us how many different points in our democracy have to go well in order for our elections to work. State officials, local officials, the courts, voters themselves. So there are a lot of moving parts in here and we have to get it right. It only takes a few weak links, as we saw in 2020, for things to go horribly, horribly wrong. So in addition to the advice that Joanna gave us about what you can do, I would stress three things. First, Read good journalism, support good journalism. If you're sick of silly polls, if you're sick of people screaming at each other, if you're sick of uh, outlets that um, really deal in trivial matters, don't patronize them. Go out and get a subscription to good, hard news coverage. Go out and support a local paper in your area. Those are dying uh, by the wayside. They're incredibly important for covering local races. Imagine if George Santos had been better covered um, by the press. Uh, He would never have gotten to Congress, I think. So support good journalism and tune out and tune off bad journalism. Second thing I would recommend is you all have your own platforms. We all complain about social media for good reason, but you can also use it constructively to share information about groups like Citizens United. Go on your Facebook page, go on your Twitter feed and tell people about the good organizations that are out there and the sorts of things that they can do to help democracy. Social media has really been a thorn in the side of democracy, but it's also an unbelievable tool for organizing. And you can reach people who don't live near you, who you never may have met, um, but you can use your voice very strenuously. And the third thing I would suggest is that you really change the way you look at elections. There are many things to be dissatisfied with and about. Joe Biden is not the perfect president. He is involved in wars in which there are no good answers. Not every legislative proposal that you wanted got through. But you have to back up. And as Joe Biden says, don't compare me to the almighty. Compare me to the alternative. And in this election, it is a choice. Democracy, with all its flaws, all of its problems, or Donald Trump's dystopia of authoritarianism, of cronyism, of corruption. And frankly, there shouldn't be any choice. It shouldn't be close. So when you hear people complain, oh, the prices are too high. Yes, inflation is still an issue. If you hear people complain, I really don't like the way he's handling the war, you can say, well, there are good reasons to debate the handling of these issues. But when it comes down to voting, democracy, authoritarianism, It really is a binary choice. So 
I implore you to keep your concerns, your objections in perspective. If democracy doesn't survive, none of the other issues you care about are going to get advanced. So thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this program and you enjoyed our other programs, please tell your friends. They can get Jen Rubin's Green Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever they get their podcasts. Bye-bye.